my daughter went missing in the woods, but showed up at my front door weeks later. My daughter Kennedy is 13 years old, but she thinks like a wise grandma. She never causes any trouble and knows what's best for herself. She never needed any help with anything, and she relied only on herself. It started to get really bad when she turned 10. Me and my wife, Lauren, thought it was cute when she wanted to do everything on her own. But it got out of hand when she would totally break down if we tried to help her. She never asked us for help with school and never asked my wife for advice for boys, like most preteens would. We got so worried when she stopped eating and lost 10 pounds because of how focused she was in school. Kennedy was our first kid at the time, so we had to ask around on how we could help her. The local parents had some basic ideas, like going on a vacation or having a family game night every Friday. Me and my wife had already thought of these, but they never worked out in the end. Kennedy always found a way to think of school and work. We kept on asking the parents when one couple said, take her on a camping trip. Me and Lauren really thought about this idea. It would be a secluded cabin by a nice lake. It would be a perfect opportunity to have some family time without anything in our way. Little did we know that, that would be the worst mistake of our lives. So on June 28, 2013, we left for the cabin. Lauren's parents used to use the cabin all the time before they died, so they left the cabin for her. Lauren was excited because she hadn't been there since she was 17. I remember the whole way there. It's hard to forget a day like that. The weather was great, the sky was blue, the wind was just right. We had a little party in the car. But of course, Kennedy didn't want to join in. When we got closer to the cabin, the smooth road became gravel. When we got there, Kennedy immediately got out of the car and ran down to the lake. It was weird because Kennedy hated lakes because of how they were infested with bacteria and diseases. Me and Lauren unpacked the car while Kennedy sat down in front of the lake. This is going to be a lot better than we planned, Lauren said, placing down her suitcase in the cabin. I know. I think this was a good idea, I said as I was placing down the last of our bags. Lauren brought her stuff upstairs to our room while I took a look around. I've never been to this cabin before. All of this was new to me. After an hour or two, Kennedy still didn't come inside. Me and Lauren didn't bother to bring her in because she looked like she really liked the outside. But it was getting dark, so I went outside while Lauren was cooking some hamburgers. Kennedy, I yelled a little. Dinner's almost ready, so come back inside. No answer. Kennedy, I yell a little louder this time. Boo. Kennedy comes up from behind me and scares the living shit out of me. Oh my gosh, Kennedy. Don't scare me like that. I'm holding my heart through my shirt. Kennedy grins and walks inside. Kennedy was way more mature than this, but I brushed it off because maybe she felt more at ease out here. We had our hamburgers and went upstairs to go to sleep. Kennedy was happier and energetic, which is the total opposite from when she was at home. At home, Kennedy is sad and gloomy and so, so tired. When Lauren finished brushing her teeth, I told her what happened when I was calling in Kennedy from outside. And of course, she just said it's because of the change of scenery. But I had a bad feeling in my gut, but I was too tired to think much of it. So I fell asleep. I was first up, so I decided to make breakfast for a change. I finished cooking some pancakes and went upstairs to wake the girls. I went into mine and Lauren's room, and she was sleeping so peacefully. I gently shook her to wake her up. Rise and shine, breakfast is ready. Lauren smiled a bit and got up. I was on my way to Kennedy's room, when a wave of a rotten stench took over. I almost threw up on the spot, but I had to swallow it back. I slowly walked up to Kennedy's door and opened it. Her window was open, 
and there was a dead deer laying on its side behind her bed. The deer was in shreds, the inside on the outside. Its eyeballs were nowhere to be seen, and there were bugs all inside and out. I looked around and Kennedy was gone. I yelled for Lauren, telling her that Kennedy's missing. Lauren ran to Kennedy's room and held back a mouthful of vomit. She ran back to our room and quickly dialed 911. It took them 25 minutes to get to the cabin because we were literally in the middle of nowhere. They searched around the cabin and a little in the woods but found nothing but a piece of clothing that Kennedy had on. We had to leave our things back at the camp so that the detectives could do a search. Me and Lauren got asked questions like, what were you doing when she went missing? And stuff like, did she act different before Anne? You know, like the ones on TV. We soon got released and went back home. Lauren fell ill a couple of days after the disappearance, so I had to take more days off of work to care for her. Lauren didn't eat and had many nightmares about Kennedy and the dead deer in her room. I got her into therapy two weeks after Kennedy went missing. I was worried about Lauren and the things she could do to herself. Lauren was progressively getting better after every session, and so she started eating more as a result. We were having chicken alfredo that night when we got a knock at the door. It was a soft knock that could have been mistaken for the wind. At first that's what we thought, however, so we continued eating until the soft knock turned into a bang. We both jumped and stared at the door for a good minute, then I got up to check the door. I opened the door slowly, and then I saw Kennedy standing on the front steps. She smelled disgusting, and looked like she'd been to hell and back. I quickly let her inside and Lauren ran to her, while sobbing on her shoulder, squeezing her in a tight hug. I quickly called the ambulance, and gave her a tight hug, despite her smelling like a dead animal. When we got to the hospital, there were doctors outside already waiting for her with a stretcher. Kennedy was rushed inside while me and Lauren waited in the waiting room. It took about 25 minutes before a nurse came out and let us into her room. She didn't say anything while we were there, even when the police came in and questioned her. She was silent. She was allowed out the next day because her cuts weren't that bad. On the way home, I took a quick peek at the rearview mirror to check up on Kennedy and found her already looking at me no emotion in her eyes. I got startled and quickly looked away. When we got home, she immediately went up to her room and slammed the door so loud it made me jump. Lauren and I were worried when she didn't come down for dinner. It was finally time for bed when I heard a thump come from her room. Me and Lauren rushed to her room and were shocked by what we saw. A tall, dark man holding a dead deer over his shoulder. I quickly turned around looking for the light switch. And when I looked back, the man was gone. The only thing left was the deer. It looked identical to the deer at the cabin. Kennedy was wide awake with the same cold expression on her face. I doubted for a bit that she saw anything because of her reaction, but Lauren swore she saw Kennedy awake during everything. She also said she saw a small smirk on her face. Of course I didn't believe her, because she could have easily been wrong, and it was pretty dark, so I didn't pay attention to that. I ran up to Kennedy, but she didn't even look at me. She was staring at the deer with the slightest bit of excitement in her eyes. I told Lauren to call the police and fill them in on what we saw while I took Kennedy outside. The house reeked of dead animal and I couldn't handle it, even though I've smelt the stench multiple times. It's just something that you can't get used to. Kennedy fell asleep on my shoulder while waiting for the police to arrive. They did a deep search in the house, but came up with nothing. Me and Lauren packed up some things for us and Kennedy, and went to a hotel for the night. It would take a while for that smell to leave the house. When we got there, Kennedy was still passed out so I had to do two trips. After dropping off Kennedy in our hotel room, 
I went back down to get the leftover things in the car. I could see my car from inside the hotel. And then I saw him again. The same tall black figure that was in Kennedy's room the same night. I rubbed my eyes, thinking that I must have been seeing things because of how exhausted I was. But he was still right there, right beside my car, looking at me. I felt shivers down my spine and a bad feeling in my gut. I should have never walked up to that man, but I was too stubborn to let him walk free. I stomped outside and faced him, but sort of. This man was a lot taller than I thought, and I'm a pretty tall man myself. I'm around 6'1". This man was way taller than me. You could have mistaken him for a slender man if he wasn't so dark and didn't look so humanly. I looked up at him and he slowly looked down. Who are you? I yelled at him with frustration in my voice. Why won't you leave my Kennedy alone? I was huffing at this point. And then he moved. He bent down a little bit and he started to put his hand up over my face. I tried so hard to get out of his grip, but nothing worked. And then I passed out. I woke up in the hotel room with Lauren sleeping on the other end of the bed. I quickly got up, looking around frantically, expecting to see the man again. But he was gone. Lauren woke up because of how hard I was breathing and comforted me, telling me it was just a bad dream. But I swear it wasn't. Ever since that day, I swear I've been seeing this man everywhere I go. I've seen him at work, at the end of my bed, around the corners in my house, even when I'm out in public. But the place I see him most is in Kennedy's room. I don't know if I'm crazy or not, but I swear she can see him too. Whenever I see this man somewhat close to her, he's automatically in a great mood. She gets talkative, she hangs out with us. She even cooks us dinner once in a while. But when this man leaves, she almost immediately loses all motivation to continue what she was doing. When he's not around, she gets violent. And I don't mean like saying mean things. I mean like full-on punching me or slapping Lauren for no particular reason. Lauren can't bring herself to be hard on Kennedy ever since the incident. But I'm as hard on her as I was before. I ground her and take her phone. Nothing big. One night, the man was around. The Kennedy was all happy and cooking dinner. Me and Lauren were watching a show. When I looked back, the man was crouched down to Kennedy's height, whispering something in her ear. Kennedy chuckled a bit, then walked away. But the man didn't follow her. He just stood there looking at me. I jumped off the couch, scaring Lauren. I ran over to him. Leave my family alone. I said, making sure to keep my voice down so I didn't worry Lauren. The man laughed, a wicked, weird laugh. It hurt my ears so much I had to cover them with my hands. Kennedy came back with something in her hand. A dead rat. She looked surprised when she saw me, quickly hiding the rat behind her back. I looked back at the man, but he was gone. Disappeared out of thin air. Lauren was sitting on the couch, looking at us in confusion. I grab Kennedy's hand and show the dead rat to Lauren. We need to call someone about this. I said with no hesitation in my voice whatsoever. Lauren looked disgusted and almost threw up. I got Kennedy to throw the rat outside and then go upstairs to pack her stuff. I didn't know what I was going to do at that moment. But I knew I didn't want this thing in my house anymore. It may seem mean of me to call my daughter a thing if you were in my position, then you would say it too. Kennedy finished packing and we got into the car. We drove around for 45 minutes so that I could find out what to do with her. Then I thought of it. The perfect place for someone like her would be a mental hospital or something. I didn't know a lot about mental illnesses, but I was sure that Kennedy had one. We did everything we needed to and left her there. A big weight lifted off my back after we got in the car. I felt a little guilty for doing that, but what else could I have done? It was my first time dealing with something like that, 
and no one would understand if I told them. That night I had the worst nightmare about Kennedy and the man, but I can't bring myself to say it. It still disgusts me to this day. I swear I've been seeing Kennedy in her room, just standing there. But when I rub my eyes, she's gone. I can't explain the things I'm seeing to anybody, but I'm sure you guys will understand.